for those who are um, short on time, I'll be recording this session. Although we don't have the high quality video, so we have to rely on the web. So uh, you can stay as, as far as you want, and you can leave the video recording if you want. You're talking about the webcam, not this. Sorry? No, when you say recording, you're talking about that one. Yeah, I'm talking about this webcam. Okay, so uh, today we are going to review the entire module from lecture one all the way to lecture nine. And then uh, after that, we'll have, if you have any questions, we'll have a QA and a session afterwards, right? I hope um, most of you finish the uh, sub-project number three as well. We start from the uh, first lecture where we, uh, if you recall the updates, it's like it's really far away, but it was only 13 weeks before. We had this slide, what will be covered in this module? Right, and then I told you this is the first IT design module that builds on the prior knowledge of the 2021 and some from 2027 and also um, some those who took other modules such as the E447, for example, at the component level, also deep dives into the integrated aspects. And we focus on the CMOS analog IC, and we use the industry standard cadence for the PDKs that resembles the actual PDK, meaning that what you have designed is actually what we use in the fabricated chip. And the following topics was to be covered, was the one is the circuit simulation. Now you're very familiar with it. Current sources and mirrors, you know what you're talking about here, biasing the transistor into saturation. Frequency response and composition, we also know what you're talking about here, the bandwidth, and you want to make sure the amplifier is not oscillating. <coughs> Single and multi-state amplifiers, this is basically subproject three. Differential amplifier analysis and design, also subpart number three. Operational amplifier analysis and design. So you can combine the differential amplifier with the single stage amplifier that's just an operational amplifier. And that's what you learn. And last but not least, we have the bias circuit, which is to generate the internal bias point for the transistor three saturation. And I told you how to study this module. At that time, probably you didn't understand what I was talking about. But now, if you revisit this slide, you understand what we're talking about. I told you to pay attention to the analysis process and understand the details of circuit operation instead of memorizing the equation. Master the basic circuit anal analytical skills, search as a DC and a small signal <coughs> analysis. Right? And then circuit design should not be done by using formula sheet. You understand what that means now. You have uh, mastered the uh, equation-based calculation and then you run, start running the simulation and you find everything wrong. Right? That's what we often encounter up to now. And that's so only we always do that. And use the software simulation to reinforce your understanding, verify the circuit function, and troubleshooting your circuit. And design your circuit based on understanding instead of trial and error. Although I still see some of you relying on trial and error, but I see that compared to some project number one, it's much better now. So why do we need the hand calculation? Is to remove or reduce the number of trial and errors to put you approximately into operation here. <coughs> and also, don't blindly, don't blindly trust the simulation results 
Um, many, many of you already got this in soft problem number two, um, where you had the wrong input and then got the simulation was all wrong, then you, you shouldn't trust it. You need to sit back and think, is this the software I'm getting? Is that reasonable? Right? And what is the usefulness of this module? I repeat that. Uh, the module is useful, obviously, if you intend to do an FIP in IC design or intend to work in IC related company or even starting up. And we have um, your former senior who actually started up and he's doing pretty well. I don't know if you heard about Astrid uh, Semiconductor, which many FIP students are actually using it. He's a graduate from NUS and he started off his company. Um, if you intend to specialize in IC design for your future career, then obviously this will be very helpful. And module also serve as a prerequisite for other modules. And one thing I can tell you is that um, I teach both digital and analog, right? But I can tell you the analog design is either you get it or you don't get it. There's nothing in between. If you don't get it, you don't get it. If you get it, you're already good. And I can see that all of you actually already got it. It's a matter of not getting a confidence in yourself, but that's very, very important. And these days, ironically, the animal design, if I can say, your value is really skyrocketing. So try your best to leverage on that. All right, so these are the outlines, and this is also the same um, outline we'll be covering today. <coughs> so we'll be going through all of it. Right? So we'll be going through the MOSFET, start off with, this is a new, Single stage identifier, thickest response, current source and years, differential pair, operation of the bar, frequency response unit is about stability, base margin, bias circuit, and then some of that. Any questions up to this point? All right, it'll be a long journey. Probably we should have a break in between. Okay, the first lecture, I told you to forget about this. And whenever you see a transistor in analog design, make sure that transistor, unless it's very intended, sometimes you might you intentionally make it off state or trial, but for amplifiers, you must make sure the amplifier, the transistor is in saturation. And how do I know if a transistor is in saturation or not? To date, to this day, I know that most of you are now applying this and meaning that as, well, as soon as you run the simulation, BC simulation, you know immediately if it's in saturation or not. But I still see some of you relying on these equations, and I'm not gonna block you doing that, but that's not going to be effective. That will be very time consuming, and it's not actually needed, right? Then how do I know if a transistor is in saturation or not? If this is an NMOS, make sure the gate voltage is lower than the drain, right? Or, if the gate voltage is higher than the drain, the difference is no more than the threshold. And where does that criteria come from? That is actually coming from the equation, right? For a transistor to be in saturation, the BDS has to be a little greater than BGS minus the threshold. And by now, you know what the BGS minus BTH is, that's the overdrive voltage. We have been learning and using over and over again. But anyway, <coughs> if the BDS is um, past the overdrive voltage, then it's in saturation. And this, also, this is also aligned with your alpha screen, right? We are making sure that the transistor overdrive voltage is met, even with the lowest screen or highest screen. That also falls into this character now, you can see that. But anyways, VDS can be divided into VD minus VS. VGS will be divided into VG minus VS, and then if you do the sanitization, if you simplify, this is the equation you're getting. Bg minus Bd is lower than the threshold voltage. And if you want to make sure that this positive gate and positive drain voltage, if you subtract that, is lower than the positive threshold, there are two options. One is if the drain voltage is greater than the gate, then the left-hand side becomes negative, whereas the right hand is positive, automatically satisfies. That's this key. Right? In other cases, if the Bg is greater than the drain, and then the difference is still lower than the threshold. That's this case, right? So instead of writing this equation, just be intuitive. Just look at the DC voltage, drain voltage and gate voltage. Make sure this is higher than the gate. Or 
If A is higher than the vein, the difference is no more than the threshold. The same thing will apply in chemos. In chemos case, A voltage is higher than the drain, or if A voltage is lower than the drain, the difference is no more than the threshold. Where does that come from? It's still from the override voltage. Drain to source or source to drain in chemos should be maintained greater than the override voltage to go than the two. All right? Any questions here? It's not clear. And IV characteristics, what does that mean? I is the current and V is the voltage. And as you can see, we write it in a capitalized I and capitalized V. What does this mean? Now you already know what this means. It's intentional I voltage in capitalized I and capitalized V. This means I'm talking about whether this transistor is in saturation or not. And how do you know that? The drain current equation for the saturation using EM loss is written something like this. The drain current is equal to half of K prime with the aspect ratio multiplied by the override voltage squared plus one plus large PDS. <coughs> if you do consider the channel length modulation, if you ignore it, this is what you're getting. And now you understand why this drain current equation was overly emphasized throughout the module is because not only in the DC analysis, but for GM calculation, for the lambda calculation, for, for many things, we are coming back to this equation <coughs> and use the derivative of that, right? And channel length modulation refers to when you have the drain current, VDS, if the transistor is in saturation in the ideal transistor, because it's in saturation, the current doesn't increase anymore. But in reality, there's a channel length modulation and there's a slight slope, which is also related to the not, R not. And this is where we find the overdrive voltage of VGS minus VTH. All right, any questions? Now, let's go to large model, uh, large signal model. A transistor in saturation means you are trying to de increase the drain to source voltage, meaning that you apply more voltage to the drain, but the current of the drain doesn't increase anymore. It's saturated. That's why it's called a saturation region, right? And if it is an ideal transistor, this saturation is a perfect parallel to the x-axis. But in reality, there's a slight increase. That's what the channel length modulation is about. Nevertheless, saturation region, you're using this. And most of the time for DC operation, for example, for the final exam or for your hand calculation, most of the time you can ignore this channel length modulation. Although these days for like, for example, uh, 14 nanometers, this channel length modulation is quite significant. So you cannot actually ignore it. You need to consider that. But for the 0.18 process you're using, you can safely ignore it for simplicity. Now, PMOS is the opposite. The priorities are the opposite. <coughs> how do you do? You remember how to turn on the PMOS? Is to make sure that the gate voltage with respect to the source is lower, so that cores will be collected underneath the gate and the channel is uniform. And that gate voltage has to be at least threshold voltage lower than the source, right? So everything is the opposite of the PMOS aspect. But nevertheless, being saturation is the same. Just note the polarity is the opposite. Now you're talking about the source to drain voltage because source is higher voltage in PMOS. All right, any questions? All right. W of L, which is the aspect ratio and the overdrive voltage, which is the BGS minus threshold, and the drain current always start from this relation, which should be used over and all over again, right? And that's where many things are coming from. For example, we always make sure the overdrive voltage is at least 200 millivolt. That's a rule of thumb for design. The absolute minimum that you have to guarantee to maintain the transfer in saturation would be around 50 to 100 millivolt. But that would be too dangerous. You're too close to the trial region. That's why I advise you to give at least 200 millivolt for the overdrive voltage would be some margin on it. <coughs> but anyways, that's how the small signal model was in use. Now, 
This is not the SD or the ES. Now we're talking about H source voltage on the x-axis. So you shouldn't confuse this from this graph. Right? Here we are talking about BES or BSD depending on King of Denmark's range of source. Whereas here we are talking about gate source, meaning if you increase the gate voltage, at some point the transistor turns on. If the transistor turns on, the current will start flowing. Right? And then if the current starts flowing in the saturation region, you'll be seeing <coughs> the vertical graph going up. That's ideally what's going on. But nevertheless, for a given point of time, because there's a certain slope in reality, if you have a small signal, let's say this is the operation region where it's in saturation, and if you try to perturb the gate voltage very little, correspondingly there will be changing in the drain current. Right? That's the key. That's how the amplifier works. If you have a small change in the gate, you'll have a, a fluctuation correspondingly. The drain. And if that small signal is small enough, you can linearize it as a triangle. Right? So this is actually an important aspect. I didn't mention explicitly in, in the, when we were learning about this in the lecture, but for this aspect, for amplifier to be linear, do you want this slope to be a first order equation or like an elliptic or a second order like this? I change my question. Let me repeat my question. If you want to have a good linear amplifier, do you want the slope to be gradually changing like this, or do you want it to be straight line? It's very clear, right? You need to have it in a straight line. How do you guarantee it? If you have a smaller input change, you can approximate better the linear moving, right? So if your input is very small, your output will be linearly corresponding. But if your input amplitude becomes greater, you are going to deviate from this linear relation, which results in distortion. 3.4ac doesn't talk anything about distortion, right? Because I just want you to learn the basic topic, topic which is very important. But if you're into audio, for example, who's into audio field? The audio field meaning audio amplifiers and you know that you don't want to get into that hobby because it's very costly. <laughs> what do they do in all the amplifiers? All the amplifiers really want to make sure that the amplifier is linear. And have you heard about vacuum tubes? Especially if you're an audio geek, you might have heard about it. Now, the transistor has the special voltage and this linear relation. You're operating probably around uh, 3 volt, 5 volt maximum. If you're talking about CMOS, no more than 3 volts, typically. Vacuum tube has a range of around 200 volts. Right? So this linear, this field, the curve is much more gradual compared to the CMOS. And that's why it's more linear. And regardless of the poor reliability, the audio amplifiers, people still use, I mean, I'm talking about serious audio geeks. I'm not, I'm not in that. But anyways, those people still use vacuum tubes. That's why I'm trying to say. Anyways, if you're going to linearize it, how do you approximate this relation? From this elliptic curve, how do you make it linear? You do the Taylor series expansion, which I know that you don't want to get into. But anyways, that's why I really uh, made it as a, as a, as a small uh, heuristic as possible. If you have a small ID, which is the delta ID, and lowercase ID means you're now talking about AC signal, and then corresponding this corresponding delta ID is caused by the corresponding change in the gate voltage. Small amount change in the BGS. Those relation is related to the GM. So how much you change in the gate results in change in the drain current. That's the GM concept, transconductance. How well you're conducting current. So if you think about it, how well you're conducting your current is the inverse of resistance. Resistance is how well you're blocking your current, right? Because it's inverse of the resistance. Resistance is voltage divided by current. Here you're talking about current divided by gate voltage. That's the transconductance, and that's where you're getting this GN concept, right? ID has a linear relation in a small signal model, and that's where the small signal model is coming from. You need to guarantee 
assume that the input is small enough compared to the bias voltage level. In other words, if you're talking about AVD of 1.8 and your input is swinging like one volt, you are no longer in linear, linear relation with the gate change as swing because that change in huge fluctuation in the input will actually significantly affect the green current. It's no longer in linear relation. All right? Any questions? Okay. So if the linearized relation is met, then you can have the voltage controlled current, dependent current source, which depends on how much change you make in the VGS. Gate voltage, you'll have corresponding green current change. That's what the small signal model is. And now you can see what's missing in that small signal model. This is an ideal transistor model, but what is missing? Yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, in here, the current source, do you remember what, what is the output resistance of the current source? Now it's time for you to synthesize the information you've collected so far. The voltage source, what is the output impedance? <clears throat> Memorize it. Think about it. Let's say this is the voltage source. Whatever the resistance value you're going to attach, you want to pass the voltage you generated. What should be the output impedance of a voltage source? Zero. What about current source? You have a current source <coughs> attached. Whatever the load you attach, you want to deliver the constant current. If you have a zero or small resistance, what happens if you have a high resistance attached? Current will change. So what is the resistance you want to have in the current source output? Infinite. You have a, can you see the infinite resistance attached here in parallel? Now you can see that, right? And of course, the ideal transistor is infinite. R0 is infinite, but the non-ideal transistor that you have been dealing with, you have alpha resistance. That alpha resistance, how much is it related to the brain current? Do you remember something that's strangely familiar with? Come on, you already know this. Right? Can you now associate that information? Sorry. The alpha resistance is actually related to the slope in a saturation region. And the slope, if you have a longer channel, will be more gradual. If you have a shorter channel, <coughs> the slope will be higher, steeper. If you have a steeper slope, this is current, this is voltage. That means the resistance will be lower. Can you see that? Do you understand? Right. <coughs> so in the ideal transistor, you don't have that output resistance, but in the real transistor, you always have the output resistance attached between brain and source. All right. Now, the transconductance can be derived from the equation from the ID. Partial, di partial difference, differential equation for the delta, BGS over, I mean ID over BGS. And drain current equation, you already know about how we get it. And that's where we're going to get the transconductance in the saturation region. It'll be K prime, the aspect ratio multiplied by the order of voltage. Or you can expand it to the square root of from the drain current equation. Or twice the ID divided by the overload voltage. Okay. That's now, you, you can probably now associate the information we have been using. And we seldom use the linear, linear region because most of the transistors you're dealing with in analog and analog is saturation. All right, any questions? All right, alpha resistance R0, this is what I was talking about. So now we attach the R0, which is one over lambda ID. Right? The smaller the RD lambda, which means the closer to this ideal transistor, the smaller, the greater the R0. The steeper the slope, the greater the lambda, the smaller the R0. That you can see that relation. 
That's why I'm saying if you're talking about smaller channel at 14 nanometers compared to 315 <coughs> nanometer process, the slope becomes steeper and steeper, meaning the output from the distance will become lower and lower. And watch the intrinsic gain that you can get from a transistor for a advanced process node. Lambda is greater, R node is smaller, gain is Gm multiplied by R naught, so gain will drop. So in that aspect, do you want to use advanced process node for analog designer? No, you don't want to. As an analog designer, if you had a choice, probably you would you would like to use the advanced, the avoid the advanced process node at all costs. Although these days, as an SOC system on chip, you might have to um, decide collectively with the digital designers and analog, analog designers. And while the analog designers have a way to get away with this by designing larger transistor by themselves, right? Digital designer doesn't have the left that luxury. That's why most of the time digital designer has to use the fan process node and analog designers can attach adapt to it, not the vice versa. Alright? And now body effect, if you uh, remember what it was, is if you have transistor is an NMOS, there's a hidden terminal, body terminal. And NMOS body is typically connected to the lowest potential in a circuit. And if it is a single supply system, lowest potential will be ground, normally. But in tutorial, you might you remember that we had a dual supply system. Dual supply was using BDD and minus BDD. In that case, what is the lowest potential in the system? Minus BDD. In that case, where do you connect the body of an MOS to? Minus BDD, because that's the lowest potential in the system. That's what you need to understand. But what I'm trying to say is, what happens if it's non-zero? Let's say the source is zero, but the body was 0 0.1 volt. <coughs> Sometimes you intentionally do that. The result is, threshold voltage was decreased. You can intuitively think of this way. This is not 100% accurate description, but you can intuitively think if you apply the gate body bias, you can think of this channel being already pre-charged a little bit. So you just need to top up a little bit further from the gate, which means the threshold voltage will drop. And FB junction, source to bulk, which is, remember this is NPN, and P side is elevated, that means you are slightly forward biasing this junction which implies you cannot go beyond 0 0.4 because then you will abruptly turn on the diode, which should be normally reverse bias by connecting the p-type to the ground and source side or drain side to the higher potential. But if you accidentally turn this on, this will remove more low lower function of the transistor. That's what the body effect is about. And the back gate transconductance is happening due to the body effect and normally for hand calculation, we ignore this. Uh, this will be no exception for your final exam or even for your calculations. You have seen that already. So typically, the threshold voltage does change with the body biasing. However, we, we don't calculate that, take that into account normally when you calculate it, unless you're in a to. Nevertheless, this is what's going to happen. If you have the higher potential in the body, higher potential in the body means this voltage will be if you're subtracting, which means this will be uh, negative, and then that means the threshold voltage will cause correspondingly drop. That's where the threshold voltage drop is coming from. And so is the PMOS. PMOS case you can control. Typically, the body of the PMOS is always tied to the source, but if it's not, you can intentionally uh, control the threshold voltage for PMOS. But with that, you can consider this that gate as a second gate would be eta, eta being typically about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, depending on the process you're using. So if it is, eta is 0 0.1, you can approximate this transconductance to be just a normal transconductance. If eta is 0.3, probably you do need to <coughs> incorporate this back gate transconductance on top of the forward transconductance, resulting around 1.3, right? Any questions? Thank you.
one. Same goes with the PMOS. You have the backgate joint conductance. Now, this was the small signal model. Ideal one didn't have the R0, but the realistic one has the R0. But with the backgate transconductance, you'll have an additional voltage dependent current source. And this voltage is not the gate voltage, but the body voltage. That's how you're going to see that. All right? And the resulting drain current will be, in the small signal, will be instead of just GM, DDS plus DDS divided by R0, you have the backgate transconductance portion added. Now, then we learned about the plastic capacitance and the polling gate, this is part view of a MOSFET. Although in 34SC we didn't do the layout. Um, if you're interested in the layout, you can visit our lab and we'll teach you how to do that. It will be uh, another interesting journey for you. Anyway, there will be always source to poly overlap and drain to poly gate. Poly is the gate. Gate is poly, and there's an overlap. And this is due to the fact when you fabricate a system, there will be always some mismatch and there will be some discrepancy. And you want to make sure, even with that variation, make sure the drain and the poly will be meeting. That's why there's an overlap. But if you look at the vertical view, gate and the drain, and drain is conducting, gate is conducting, and there's a passive agent glass, silicon dioxide. Conducting material would be dioxide, silicon dioxide, non-conducting, and then also conducting material such as capacitors. And now you understand, at that point, when, you, when I talked about it, you didn't understand what I'm talking about, but now you know, if you, the moment you see this, there's a potential problem. What problem do you see here? Let me give you a hint. something that you might want to analyze further. If the signal was positive, what is the output signal, polarity normally? Negative. If the input was like this, output should be something like this. And you don't memorize it, you know why this is the case, right? Why? Can you explain? Yes. Because when you increase the input. Increase the gate voltage? Yes. The drain get current? The drain current flow. Increase. Increase. In, sorry, increase. Yes. And then I think more voltage will be over the RZ. That's right. That the output will drop. It. That's why normally this operates this way, complementary, right? That's why common source amplifier has flipping polarity. Well, with the capacitance in series, what's the problem? Impedance of the capacitance is 1 over SC. That means as the frequency goes up, impedance drops. At very high frequency, this is shorted. If it's shorted, what happens? Plus becomes plus. Uh oh, you have a problem because the amplifier or pad stipulates you want to have a negative phase amplifier. But the shorting pad, the higher frequency, is trying to impede in the opposite direction. And that's the nature of the zero. That's why I said if you see any pad in parallel, in the series path of the signal, then there exists a zero. This is what the zero is about. But apart from the zero, bigger problem is the fact, effectively, this will be viewed as another capacitance to the ground. Let's say this capacitance was C, then this one has A multiplied by C amount, approximately. <coughs> to be more exact, it's A plus one multiplied by C. But if the A is the gain of 100, 101 is 100. Don't be obsessed about numbers now. You understand what I'm talking about? So that E capacitance shunted to ground effectively. What is the issue with this? Can you describe what the issue with this? Yes. 
Yeah, it's a filter. What type of filter is this? Uh, it's a low pass. Can you explain why it's a low pass filter? Um, yeah, because you have a uh, capacitor shunted to join your battery. Right. If you pour, by now you can already see this, right? The moment you see the capacitors in shunted to ground, you're already pouring in your mind, pouring water here. At DC, no water leaks. At very high frequency, this is shorted. All the water leaks away. So instead of it is fed into the amplifier, input is already shunting to ground, all the signal. So if you draw the frequency diagram <coughs> of the gain, at some point, it starts rolling off. And you're not getting any gain. And if you have a higher capacitance versus lower capacitance, if you have a higher capacitance, this roll off will happen earlier. All right, so the problem, nature of the problem is as follows. You did every effort, just like you did in your subproject three, you did every effort to meet the specification of gain, DC gain of 100, if everything meets fine, and then you connect to the source, and you find, okay, my intended operation region is 10 kilohertz. Maybe ultrasound transducer. And this is not ultrasound, this is actually microphone, right? Microphone, and then you find, because the amplifier has bandwidth only up to 100 hertz, due to this Miller effect, at 10K, your gain is less than one. So you have done all these efforts in subproject number three to have the gain specification meeting, but the moment you couple up with the 110K, you are not getting any gain. That's the thing that you don't want to see, right? That's the bandwidth problem we are dealing with. Of course, you have already tested the stability, your bandwidth is already met, so the spec is already met, so you don't see this problem, right? But if you don't design carefully, you might encounter this type of problem with the existence of the gate, gate to drain overlapping capacitors. Any questions of the discussion? <coughs> All right, good. And the single state amplifiers, we have this analog optimum. Uh, if you try to decrease the power dissipation, that will correspondingly decrease the voltage swing. If you try to increase the voltage swing, the power dissipation goes up. If you try to reduce the voltage swing, noise is going to be a problem. Right? Signal swing becomes lower, that means noise, your effective noise gets, gets a bigger problem. And all of these are trade-off, like if you try to input, increase the gain, correspondingly you have to also increase the supply voltage, which increasing the supply voltage has a good effect on the voltage swing, but they will counter the power dissipation. So that's why you need to, as an analog designer, you have to really delicate, you have to juggle with these eight balls around, and that's basically what you have successfully done in subproject three. So I'm happy to see that. You might have missed one or two, that's still fine, but dealing with the rest of the uh, problem, rest of the issue, you are already juggling. And if you see someone um, saying that, oh, I have improved on four or eight, that's fishy. You might have to double check that. And you do see people sometimes do that. And that's not true. Okay, there may be a case that your application doesn't require strict power dissipation. Meaning that if you're talking about power um, amplifier in an you know, automobile or cars, probably you don't have to worry too much about power dissipation. You want, you want to have a higher voltage swing and etc. If you're talking about your mobile phones, power dissipation is everything. <coughs> So these are the things that you might want to deal with. Now, single state amplifier with the registered load. Okay, I think we're, we're, uh, we can speed up a little bit. Can you tell me what's the gain of this amplifier? At 100, you already know this. Let's assume the transconductance of this M1 is GN. That's right. Everyone knows that, right? Uh, Daniel? Daniel? Yeah. Uh, can you see the gain of this amplifier is GMRG? Uh, yeah. That's right. Now, that's good. Do you see any problem with this amplifier? 
I don't know. Okay, not, not only you, anyone. Can, can anyone tell me what's the issue with this amplifier? If any. Low gain will be, okay, that depends on what argument you're <coughs> catching, right? Okay, let me give you a hint. What happens if you try to increase the gain? Simplest way is to try to increase RD, because gain wants to be MRD. What happens if you increase RD? The upper level, D out. Let's say if your VDD was two volts, what is the nominal D out you want to have? One volt. If you increase RD, what happens? The nominal level drops. If your nominal level drops, the amount of swing you can get is correspondingly reduced. And with the higher gain, it's likely you have a higher gain, higher swing. But because of this lower DC level in the output, that higher swing cannot be achieved without distortion. That's actually countering the core point of increasing the RD and gain. That's the point, the problem with resistive load, right? Forget about uh, these uh, equations. The GMRD is what the gain is, and the problem is the RD limits the output swing. So that was a trade-off of the gain and output swing. And increasing the gain by increasing GM also has a problem because the GM can be increased by having greater aspect ratio, which means larger area, which means larger power. <laughs> so you want to have a clear trade-off. <coughs> That's why there are some things that you want to avoid, which means having higher gain. So how do you actually solve that issue? Can you have a magic device that does not affect the DC level, remain at one volt, yet increase the R0, R0 or the AC signal to distance? Right? That's the magic device we already know, by the way. And what is that source or device that has a high DC, AC gain, AC resistance, but small DC gain? That's the transistor exaggeration. Some of you are still confused what I'm talking about, so I repeat it here. Maybe I have a graph here. Don't be confused, this is range source voltage. Right. This solves the relation for a given VG, let's say VG was one volt. If you look at it, once you get into saturation, there's a small change. When you change the range source voltage, there, there's a small change in the ID. And I said the ideal transistor will have a totally flat totally flat operation means, whatever the change in the voltage doesn't change the grain current, which means infinite resistance. And that resistance I'm talking about is respect to the perturbance in the gate. Perturbance in the gate, that's very important. And you don't get any change there. And if you think about it, what is the DC <coughs> resistance? Let's say this was one volt, grain to source voltage was one volt. And at that point, you have correspondingly one milliamp. The DC bias current is C, one volt divided by one milliamp, which is one joule. That's the DC. DC resistance, how do you calculate it? Basically, that's the angle. Voltage divided by, from that plot, that point. If you're going to divide the voltage by the current, that's the DC current. Resistance seen by DC. AC resistance is different. If you start perturbing the input here, what is the corresponding perturbance in the grain? <coughs> and that one, the flatter the slope, the greater you get. And it's quite normal, you get like kilo ohms order in DC, and then hundreds of kilo ohms in the AC, or tens of kilo ohms. That's the magic device you want to catch. So if you attach this, what is this? This is a transistor and saturation to this. Then problem solved. You have the DC level constant like one volt, but the gain is suddenly increased because the gain is about the AC signal, right? That's what I'm talking about here. One signal model. Any questions here? 
friend. God bless you all. For that, I want to replace the RD with the PMOS because you're seeing the green in the PMOS here. If you are catching MMOS, MMOS will be looking into the source zone. If you're looking into the source side, impedance will be one of the GM, very small. Or by side, you don't want that, so you want to look into green. Because you're talking about green current, you want to make sure you're looking into the green port of a saturation amplifier, saturation uh, loss step. So that's how it goes. You're going to attach the M2 with the BDC. What's the problem here now? Now you already see the problem. You have successfully achieved the goal of getting, getting the high gain, but there's one issue. By subproject number three, you know what the problem is. Where do you get this PD? Right? How do you get it? Uh, does, can anyone answer this question? How do we get to PD? Turbier is one option, right? You can have the uh, voltage regulator, you can design anything that you want. But simple as possible, we'll be having a curve mirror. So you're getting it already. So we, we want to have something missing, which provides the DC current, DC voltage of DB. And what voltage do you want to provide here? Make sure you are in the saturation region. That's the big voltage you want to apply. Right? How do you generate the VB? First of all, what's the gain of this amplifier now, Andrea? GN multiplied by? From this node, you have green R0 of M2 to zero with green R0 of M1. So the resistance will be R0 2 in parallel with R0 1, multiplied by GN. And I told you the R0 is typically orders of magnitude higher than DC resistance. The gain is actually orders of magnitude higher compared to just having a DC resistance. All right? Problem solved. Except that we need to get some somehow generate DB. Okay, team. It's R0 1 in parallel with R0 2. Very good. Now, the alpha swing, uh, simply speaking, you want to make sure the M2 is in saturation. How do you guarantee that? You want to make sure at least 200 millivolt. Here, meaning that if the VDB is 2 volt, you can only go up to 1.8. You can actually go beyond that, but you already start seeing distortion. And here, in the lower side, you want to make sure that M1 has an overdrive voltage of 200 millivolt as well. So your practical swing range will be VDB minus overdrive voltage of M2 down to the overdrive voltage of M1, All right? Any questions? Let me just skip that. And you have, this is what you already did in subproject number two as well as in three. Your intended output level, let's assume of one volt, because when you run the simulation, you found this is actually 1.2. How do you bring that down to one volt? If you think about it, basically, the buffer voltage level is the load curve of the NMOS and PMOS in the meeting, where you're meeting. So there are two options to bring this load, let's say, if this was too low, you want to bring it up, there are two options. One is change, shift the PMOS load curve to higher, that is by, then by lowering the gate voltage of the PMOS, or change the slope. Or, PMOS. or you can do the yeah, vice versa. You can change the uh, drain current of the NMOS or change the slope of NMOS. How do you change the NMOS or PMOS slope? Lambda. How do you change lambda? L. Right, you're getting it. So this is what I'm saying. You already got, you're, you're getting it. Right? I can guarantee 99% of the circuit designers don't get it, but you're getting it. So I'm happy that you're getting it. And how do you change the load curve? BGS. Yeah, if you control the BGS, you're going to shift it. Both are possible, and then you have done it. You have done it perfectly. I mean, you already know why <coughs> BGS is a question. Oh, what about changing W over L? Yes, changing W over L will result in the drain current. Higher drain current, you get a higher GN, right? Right. Uh, so let's say, um, if, for example, my PMOS has a fixed uh, BGS or BFG, and I want to change the, the curve, my power is at W over L. You can also, 
Theoretically, you can also increase the drain current by changing the WLO, but that will correspondingly change many things, like increasing the frequency response as well as the lambda and everything. So then you might want to watch out. Easier way to control it is either by length or by drain current with a gate voltage control. That's much easier to handle. But theoretically, you do you do have an option of changing the, trend, uh, the aspect ratio. Yeah. All right, so uh, we can skip this part. And to answer my question, how do you generate a media? This is the answer. You can have the current source as a current and as a load. Instead of having a DB, you can have a dial connection, which should copy the mirror current. This is called a current mirror. <coughs> and then reference current is defined by the resistance value, BDB minus this point, which is the BGS, over R, which is the reference current. That reference current will be copied here, given that M1 and M2 ratio is the same. If M2 ratio is twice that of the M1, you have twice the current in the reference that is going to the out. That's the current here. You have the corresponding the dual of that with the PMOS. So if you have the MOS gate, MOS amplifier, <coughs> M1, you want to use this type, which you did. In the sub project, you have already done it. If you have a PMOS amplifier transistor, you might want to have M2 as an active load. In that case, you have this left by MOS current here. Right. And here it comes. Thereby, we have now three transistor amplifier with the M1, M2, and M3. And the moment you see this, you now know the gate, I mean the amplifier pin, which is GN1, multiplied by R02 in parallel with R01. As I always say, when there is an unknown transistor shown like here, the first thing you have to identify is the gate and the where the input and output are, which defines which transistor is responsible for amplifier, this one. M1. Then these M2 and M3 will be either biased or low or both. In this case, M2 is collecting every load. So if you look from the output port, you have R2 and R1, which is in parallel for accessing load. Now I have a question here. How many poles and zeros do you see? Actually, that depends, right? That depends on if you do have source resistance or not. But anyway, I mean, but practically, the poles and zeros of concern depends on if you have a source impedance or not. But let us assume you do have a source impedance and you do have the load. How many poles do you see? Who thinks it's two poles? Okay, but how many poles do you think you have? Okay, if you want. No. Yes. Three? Okay. Uh, where, can you identify where these poles are? Oh, no. <laughs> How many zeros do you see? One. Where? Here. The answer is you have two poles. Where? One is here in the gate of the input, the other one is at the load. And why not here? Because those are all not relevant to this amplifying path. Amplifying path is here. And force and zeros of a concern, of course there are some other parasitic capacitors that's existing, but that's not going to affect the amplifying path. So the thing I emphasize here is that you need to identify where the amplifying path is and look at the <coughs> nodes. Two nodes are input and output. And if there's a source impedance, that node will see some capacitance. One of the capacitance will be overlapping capacitance here, here, and also the source side. But of these, particularly I'm interested in the BGD, because with the existence of source, that BGD will be amplified, multiplied by the gain, and effectively working as a shunt capacitor. That's one pole. Second pole is located at the output. Even if there's no explicit load capacitance, there is capacitance. What capacitance? Here, 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 here. Can you see that already? By now, the CG ee 3 for ac students, but if I take a note here, you already see the plastic capacitance, right? So that's good if you're getting it. 
So anyways, uh, nevertheless, the output resistance will be R01 in parallel with R02, A of GDM multiplied by that. Source power is common gain amplifier. After the single stage amplifier, we're gonna show quick, right? Source power is used when you have a mismatch in the source impedance versus the load impedance. And when do you need it? Can you explain when we need a source follower? For purpose circuit, yes. And what do we mean by that? Can anyone who didn't reply so far? Because I think almost everyone replied already. It's quite easy, right? Let us say you are you design a voltage amplifier of gain of 100. The load impedance was 10 ohm. Output impedance was 90 ohm. And you have one volt here at the output. After the amplifier, you have one volt off the screen. What's the voltage you're getting here? 0 0.1. You have successfully amplified 100 times here. And because of the mismatch in the impedance, you're getting carving away 90% of the gain. You don't want this situation. How do you prevent this? You insert a small buffer. If you look from the output port, the impedance is near zero. If you look from this port, impedance is as high as possible. That's the voltage buffer. That's what the common grain and the bar is. <coughs> All right, and the common grain amplifier works as a buffer, and that is done by source power. Why is it small output resistance? Because if you look at from this port, you'll be seeing one over GM, which is typically very small, in parallel with RS. RS is in kilo ohms, one over GM can be very, very low compared to the RS in kilo ohms. Whereas if you look at from the gate side, watch the impedance. Do you remember the MOSFET has, if you look into the port of the gate, what do you see? A glass. What is a glass? In, in terms of impedance, what's a glass? It's a passivation material. Impedance would be very high, right? So input impedance is very high, output impedance is quite low. This is exactly what we want. That's what the common, common grain amplifier does. But no, <coughs> in this case, this is where the body effect is in play. Okay? Body effect happens, you recall, when there's a difference between source voltage and the body voltage. The body is connected to the lowest potential of the, of the circuit. In this case, it's a ground. Whereas source has an elevated voltage. Why? If there's a bias current, RS multiplied by IS, I mean IE, will be the voltage over here, which is not zero. Therefore, there's source, I mean the body effect. And how specifically does that body effect affect? In other words, does it lower the threshold or does it increase the threshold? It's an interesting topic. It's not going to be the final exam, but can you think about it? How do you see that? Then you can see it by, uh, let's recall the body effect. If the body bias is increased with respect to the source, increase. threshold drops. If the body bias is lower with respect to the source, threshold increases. Let us assume the source was 2.1, body is zero. With respect to the source, body voltage is lower. Threshold voltage is higher. Can you, can you see? By doing this, your threshold voltage of the end loss will increase. Not much, but it will increase. You need to understand that. All right? Any questions? All right. Okay. Current source power can be also done with the current source. So if you look at this amplifier, it looks, I mean, at one glance, it looks very similar to what you, what you saw before, the voltage amplifier. But if you look carefully, now we have the input here and the output from the source instead of from the green. So you need to watch out, this is different. And how is it different? The M1 is actually an amplifying transistor. 
for this source power is again the voltage will be less than one. However, the impedance <coughs> is lower than what you will be normally seeing compared to the input side. And if you look at it, the source power is power, the load is actually working as a higher R0 two. So with the source follower as a load, I mean the current source as a load, you'll be getting the Rs in parallel with R2 to be around one over eta plus one Gn, and still lower because you're seeing into the source port. This is much higher if you parallel with this lower impedance, you're still getting lower impedance of one. Right? That's what you're getting. Right? And common gate amplifiers is where you have now the source, voltage source connected to the source of an amplifier with a DC bias in the gate, <coughs> the out from the VL. The gain of this amplifier in voltage will be similar to common source amplifier, such that it's GM RD. If you have a current source as a load, it will be GM R02 in parallel with R01. Then why do we use this compared to the source follower? I mean, common source amplifier. Okay, that's that's good. So one one point that you might want to use this is now here you don't have a parasitic capacitance between input to the output. If you couple the input to the gate, there's an overlapping capacitance which should be working as a mirror capacitance that lowers the bandwidth. Whereas if you come in here, there is capacitance to ground and capacitance to the output, but it is isolated by the gate to the ground. So you don't have a direct the capacitance between input to the output, which means you don't have a zero, you don't have a Miller effect. So if you have a high frequency to deal with, and exactly if you're a smartphone, your RF signal is high, high frequency, it's getting in gigahertz, right? Your carrier that you're using is typically five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. Five gigahertz is quite high. So if you couple the gate of the CMOS, it will leak away. Leak away through the Miller capacitance. Whereas the gate side, you can have the amplifier with the common gate configuration, where it has a much greater bandwidth. So typically, the front end power amplifier uses common gate configuration, right? Um, these, I think, is all covered. Anyway, you have a common source, common gate amplifier, and instead of having RD, you have the voltage swing problem, so I replaced that with the common source and current source as a load. And to bias that into saturation, we have a diode connection with this current mirror. Now, my question how many fours and zeros do you see here? You do not have Miller cap, but you do have capacitance. Capacitance source to body, source to gate. So you do have a capacitance. So there exists one pole here. The pole location is higher compared to the common source, but there is, there's a pole, right? Can you see that? And which other pole, if there are any? Yeah, there's a pole here. Any zeros? There's no direct path that shunts the input to the output. So it means that there may be another zero with other plastic capacitance, but that will be ignorable. Any zeros to concern about? No, you don't have to worry about. So there are two poles and zero and zeros. Can you see that? Yes. Ah, okay. Probably we can stop for a break after this explanation, but where's the... Um, okay, probably I'll do it this way. This in this MOSFET, what kind of <coughs> plastic capacitances do you see? The biggest, simplest, and the first capacitance that you see is C A to drain. But remember, MOSFET is a symmetric device. There is an overlap between gate and drain. So is. <coughs> Yes. Right? And
And do you remember the crucial one between source and body? And also brain and body. Do you remember this? Okay, that's good. Let's see if we can go back to this. So we're not that far away. G, uh, gate to brain does overlap, <coughs> gate to source does overlap, source to bulk, brain to bulk, four sorts of capacitance. I, I just have had four of them, these uh, specific capacitances. Now let's get back to our schematic here. This, uh, this work is source. From the source perspective, oh, where's my From source perspective, you have this capacitance and this capacitance as a perfect capacitance. And since there is a source impedance, there exists one pore. And what's the pore frequency? Do you remember? Okay, maybe I'm skipping too far away, but do you remember something like C multiplied by resistance? <laughs> That's what you want to be concerned about, right? That's exactly where you need to worry about. You have a small capacitance, which means if you have a one over RC, the frequency will be very, very high. You don't have to worry too much if it's high, but there is a fault, right? The load, typically you have a capacitance, load capacitance. So it's probably the dominant port for this one would be the load side in the output. Any questions? We'll probably I'll stop here for a short break. Oh, if after the cascode amplifier. <laughs> what is the cascode amplifier? You have the common source amplifier cascaded with the common gate amplifier. And what's the advantage of doing this? Sorry? Higher gain is one of them, yes. Why higher gain? Because if you look at it, now, if you just have this common source, R03 in pair with R01. Let's say if R03 was 100K, R01 was source of 100K, then two parallel capacitance and the resistance will be 50K. But if you have a cascode structure like this, do you remember the R0 looking to this is something like R02 multiplied by GM over GM. GM over 2 plus 1 multiplied by R01, which means 100K multiplied by much greater value. So if you have 100K with much greater value in parallel, probably it will be something like 100K. So gain will be twice compared to the previous one. Okay, so yes, gain is higher. Anything else? Yeah, the tip is, what about the frequency response? Signal path is from input all the way to the output, and you do have gate to source, gate to brain overlap on capacitance. But if you do remember the analysis of cast code, the first structure, the cast code amplifier, the gain is GM multiplied by this side. <coughs> but if you just look at up to this side, the gain is, for the first gauge, R01 in parallel with 1 over GM. 1 over GM is very small. So if you only look at the first gauge gain, first stage gain is nearly 1. So the Miller cap, remember the Miller cap is gain plus 1 multiplied by a capacitor. And if the gain capacitance multiplied by the gain is small, that Miller cap exists. However, the effect of the Miller cap is not that great because it's still in very high frequency. Means that the frequency response of the cascode structure is much greater. The bandwidth is greater than just the common source amplifier. Can you see that? Okay. It seems like we're gaining everything. Gain increases. Frequency response is better. What do you lose? Yeah. See, I, as I told you, you're getting it. This is not a joke. You're getting this up to this point. It's very, very important. You're, you're, you're being a good panel designer now. You're losing the output swing. How much output swing do you have to guarantee? I mean, the override voltage you have to guarantee here. 200 plus? 200. You're losing 200 volt here and over here. So if you suppose your VDD was one volt, you're already losing 600 millivolt, and you have very limited swing. So you cannot blindly use this. You have to know where you're getting into. 
All right, so we'll stop here for a 10 minute break <laughs> and let's return at 1.30. Okay, so the second part of today's summary will be about your biggest question. How do you find poles and zeros? <laughs> During the break, I got many questions and I, met, I told many of them. I just give me a second because that's what we're going to cover in the second half. I mean, second part, because I think we're going to have another break. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, poles. Just like every uh, content I cover in the lecture in this module, right? I'm sometimes overly simplifying, but that's needed, right? If I were to give you some ideas how to find poles and zeros, simply put it this way, poles are low pass filtering. Zeros are high pass filtering, right? And you draw from input to the output a path. And along that input to the output path, if you encounter any capacitance that shunts to the ground, capacitance that shunts to the ground, capacitance that shunts to the ground, that's low pass filter, you know this, right? Why? If you flow the water at, low, at EC, there will be low pass. At high frequency, it shunts away, that's low pass filter. So from input to output, I'm encountering two low pass filters which implies you have two poles. And then, what about this green color capacitor? What does that do? That's a high pass filter, because at DC, it blocks the path. At very high frequency, it shunts away. It shorts, so you can take a pass better. And I told you, in a very simple manner, zero is about high pass filtering along the signal path, so you have two poles and one zero. Is this clear? Okay, this is clear. <coughs> and then, with that in mind, Miller in fact stipulates if, okay, maybe this is too confident, we just go directly to the capacitor now. Okay. If you already have a capacitance that's overlapping here, this is GD. By the way, how many zeros do you see here? How do you know how many zeros or poles? You first identify where the input. You draw from input all the way to the output. How many high pass filters do you see? Of course, CE is also a high pass filter, but this is very, very big amount, meaning that it has cutoff frequency near DC, so you ignore it. Then, how many high pass filters do you see? One. How many low pass filters do you see? One. So you first identify signal input to the output, just draw like a straight line there, count how many nodes. You find one node at the input, the other node at the output. So there are two poles, one pole here, the other pole here. Are you following up to this point? Okay, good. Now this capacitance is particularly problematic. Why? Because if you draw from input to the output, there is one parallel path that is in series with the signal. And that is where the Miller effect happens. Miller effect means that it behaves just as if you have a shunting capacitance ground, and the amount of the shunting capacitance is actually gain of this amplifier multiplied by CGD. And Miller effect in common source is problematic because it is amplified by the gain, which is typically like two orders of magnitude, 10 to the power of two. And if you multiply by that, it just overwhelms all the other parasitic capacitors. 
and you have a really great capacitance value shunted to brown. I emphasize shunted to brown. That's a pole. And a great pole, I mean, great amount of capacitance in the input is problematic because it's a low pass filter with low bandwidth. It's going to carve away your signal component before you even need to enter the entry bar, which reduces the gain, right? So that's the nature of the problem of frequency response in a circuit. Any questions up to this point? Now let's get back to the problem we were handling with. Assume you have a source impedance. What do I do? I draw from the input all the way to the output. How many nodes do you see? One node at the input, the other node in between, third node at the output. Are you following? And here, what capacitance do you see? This capacitance, let's go to this capacitance. And since the first stage gain is nearly one, mirror cap is not great, but there is a mirror cap, meaning that this capacitance will be as if you have one plus one, gain of one, multiplied by CGD, turned into brown, which is the same order of magnitude as the CGS. So you have two capacitors here, right? That's one pole, because it's a low pass filter. And this node, what capacitor do you see? Source to body, source to gate, source to drain, and source to bar. Four capacitors, you see that, right? Those are all to the ground. So that's also low pass filter. Can you see that? What about other nodes? The output nodes. What capacitors do you see here? Of these capacitors, what capacitors to ground? You have one here, drain to bone, drain to bone. Both to ground. Again, low pass filter, three poles. Can you see that? How many zeros do you see? There's one overlapping capacitor, which is functioning as high pass filter. That's one zero. And many of you are confused. What about this zero? Shouldn't this zero go this way and then there's also another zero here? No. Why? Because common gate amplifier have signal path from source to drain. Why? Why can't the signal flow this way? Remember, this is DC bias. AC, ground. If you, the moment you enter this path, it goes to ground. So this is not going to be affected. So you'll be actually working as a pole from this location. So you don't have to worry about this zero. This high pass filter effect is where the zero is out. In summary, you have three poles. One zero. Can you see? Any other questions? Is it clear now? All right. Okay. Now let's get back. Left hand side pole has minus forty five per decay degrees per decay lagging at the pole frequency, and left hand pole is zero, and left hand side is zero is forty five degrees plus. Right. That's the both plot, we'll be coming back to that, so you don't have to worry about um, remembering that. But pole falls, pole, remember, is a low pass filter, pole falls at minus 20 dB per decay in a magnitude. Zero rises at plus 20 dB per decay after the frequency. That's a high pass filter, or is a low pass filter. Okay, another effect we covered. And this is a typical frequency response of an amplifier. <coughs> Problematic lies with the, the low pass, which is caused by a pole location. And how many poles do you see here? Yeah. It may be tricky, but if you understood my comment correctly, you will understand. How many poles do you see? Every pole will have minus 20 dB per decade, right? So initially you have <coughs> minus 20 per decay here, one, two, three, four, five. Can you see 
see that? Of course, I'm not going to ask you this way, but as an engineer, whenever you see the response like this, you need to be able to identify, oh, it looks like there are holes. Whenever you see decrease in the pain, that's where the hole is because that functions as a low path filter, right? And so this implies this was minus 20 and plus 20 dB, this is 20, 40, 40 dB for the case. So how many zeros were there? Two. Why? Because somewhere you have 20 dB per decade plus and another 20 dB per decade. That's where this is coming from. All right? And I hope that, that clarifies. And the only poll is about, okay, like how many polls do we have here? Now you understand. DC response minus 20 dB per decade, minus 40 dB per decade, so there are two poles, right? And if this pole location one is sufficiently lower than pole location two, when I say sufficiently, let's say the pole two is beyond the unity gain point, then this pole one is called dominant pole. Because that one point is what you need to worry about. All right? Any questions at this point? Probably you already know this. And association of poles with nodes, I already mentioned to you, this is about it. You just look at one node, and whichever the node that has a shocking capacitance to ground, that's where the pole is located. So how many poles do you see here? Oh, I see four poles. Not two, not four, right? It's two, why? Because these two capacitors in parallel can be merged into one. So you see one pole here, another pole here. How many zeros? Come on, you already need one. Any high pass capacitors you're seeing here? No, there's no zero here, okay? Are you getting it? All right, yes. Right? If you have a capacitance in between, because this is input, this is output, right? You draw the path if there's a capacitance in between, not like here. That's zero. Okay? Let's move on. So in this case, an output node, the combined capacitance will be CGD plus CDB. Multiplied by the resistance you're seeing at that node is RD. One over that amount is the pole location. That's what the association of poles with nodes is about. Then what about how do you calculate the uh, pole location over here? In frequency wise, that's one over Rs multiplied by these two capacitors combined. Is that clear? Okay, very good. And now, do you, are you clear how to count how many poles and zeros? Okay, very good. <laughs> So that's the pole location. This is the frequency response one. And the reason we split this frequency response to two part is because I wanted to make sure you get how to count the number of poles and zeros from the frequency part one. And frequency response part two, I wanted to calculate how far are these two poles away. Because you want to make sure it's like a unity, I mean one pole, single pole response. That's what you have covered it probably. Hopefully, uh, before the second break, but it depends on how fast you're going to cover it. And we had the Miller effect as well as the frequency response analysis of a single stage and the bar. Okay, up to this point, any questions? Okay. And then we come to the current source and mirrors, uh, where we already know what you're talking about. The good current source, I emphasize again, what's the output impedance of a good current source? Very high. <laughs> Why? Whatever the load you attach, you don't want the, the current amount to be affected. If the output impedance of the current source is small, then depending on if you attach zero ohm, then the current will be maintained. But if you attach a large impedance, because of the small impedance here, impedance combined will affect the current amount. Right? So that's why your output current source resistance output impedance will be very high. If you look at it, because the MOSFET in saturation has a very high AC resistance, that's an ideal current source. I mean, 
close to ideal transpose, right? That's how you're going to use it, and you have the R naught. Again, how do you control the R naught as a designer? You want to make it as flat as possible. How do you make it as flat as possible? Lambda. You want smaller lambda. How do you make the lambda smaller? Increasing the length. If someone asks, high school student asks you, how, why is increasing the length <laughs> that effectively makes it flatter response? Because with the same channel length modulation, if you have a greater length, absolute length, that slower portion difference will not be affected. That's basically how we make it flat, right? Yeah, so you're getting it. I think uh, you should replace me for the lecture <laughs> next semester. Okay, current source implementation. How do you make it? Of course, you want to bias this M1 in a saturation region. And how do you do that? You want to make sure a certain amount of voltage is applied to heat. And I don't want to do it this way. Why? When you, you already know, right? What's yeah. the problem with this? Uh, because of resistor matching and temperature variation. With resistor mismatch is one problem. And what is other problem? Bigger problem. If you have a fluctuation in the BBD, the ratio will be also fluctuating. And that fluctuation will be affecting the drain current. And you don't want that situation. Because this is a current source. Regardless of the environment, regardless of the load you are attaching, you want a constant current. And the environmental change in the VDD happens all the time. Right? So that's why you don't want this situation. How do you actually make it insensitive to the supply chain is to have this reference current generated like this, and then you're copying it. In this case, the drain current is fixed by the EGS over here, regardless of the VDD. Okay, and then you repeat mirrors. All right. And since both transistors are from the same process and with the same temperature variations, the process variation can be minimized. Whereas in the previous slide, we have the uh, registers and, and the transistor. Register and the transistor have a different variation. On top of that, you have fluctuation in the BDD. All process, both temperature and, and the voltage, all affect previous schematic, whereas this one, M1 and M2 have the variation, but the amount of variation is the same. And since you're relying on the ratio of these two, although there's a fluctuation, they are changing at the same direction, so the ratio remains the same. That's why the process variation is minimized. Okay, if I say boldly, I can say extremely, but analog designers are a little bit conservative. We become a little bit pessimistic, and let's say it's reduced instead of saying removed. And then also, if the voltage variation is little, that's the beauty of doing that. And you can copy that by just copying this voltage to these nodes. In other words, you can just copy it <coughs> by connecting this to this gate, connecting this to this gate, and vice versa. All right? Then you can copy the drain current from this reference all the way to the And the other way to look at it is if you look at the voltage and the current source here, you're converting the current into the voltage, which is VGS. And that VGS is current into the transistor here, which results in the current. So you have the current to voltage conversion and a voltage to current conversion at the same time. And this is a very simple current here. You can see that you now have a diode connected M1, which has a VGS. And then that is copied to the M2, which copies the current over here to the EDL. And what is the current over here? That's VDD minus VGS over R. And if the ratio of M1 and M2 are the same, that same current is flowing in the output node. Right? Any questions over here? Now, you already now uh, will see what are the other topic is that the current source needs to have a high output resistance. And this one, although it has high resistance of right, say, tens of kilohms, or if not hundreds of kilohms, it will be even better if you increase the resistance. How do you do that? We already know. How do you boost the output impedance? 
stack of other transistor here. You know that, right? Then the impedance will be increased, and by doing that, you are getting higher output impedance. And that's actually what the curve mirror with the stack version does. Okay, I'll just come back to this analysis. But okay, probably I'll cover it briefly, then come back to you. Is that you're going to stack another transistor here, then output impedance will be much greater at the cost of overdrive, overdrive voltage stacking, right? So you are losing something, but you're getting on the output node, on the output impedance, right? And then there, there's another thing that we wanted to cover, which was the analysis on the current mirror's error, right, the gain error. And what do I mean by that? Is that I wanted to make sure the gain error from this um, input current to the output current is minimal. So what I mean by that is because these two transistors actually have channel noise modulation, if you consider that, you will have a gain error where ideal one should have just the ratio of M12 to M1, whereas the uh, realistic one with the gain channel noise modulation will be non-zero. So you'll have the lambda divided by one plus lambda built in multiplied by the difference between the output of Br minus B. And you think in this case, you can make a systematic gain to be uh, reduced by using low channel divides, because if you have a low channel divide, you can see that you can divide and the error will be minimized. Or it can be completely removed if you have the output and the input voltage to be equal. Right? If you make it equal, meaning that this voltage and this voltage to be equal, then you're going to remove gain error. That's what we already also covered. In that context, we did some analysis here as well. Three ways to implement and handle the mismatch here is that instead of having one to two ratio in aspect ratio, you can have two identical current, I mean the transistors. And by doing that, you will minimize the mismatch caused by the process. So for example, if you have two ways to uh, implement the second transistor to be greater, the ratio is that if you reduce the first stage length, that's effectively double level L of the M2 is twice as great as the M1. However, if you look at the analysis here, the mismatch, the ratio of these two is not going to be two if there is a channel mass modulation considered. But if you have two identical transistors in parallel with the same size from the input and output, meaning that let's say W of L of M1 of 10, you have one of 10 and 10 in parallel, this, then you will have the channel length modulation completely removed in your fact, and then you are getting exact two. This is what the analog denominator prefers. All right? And here comes the cast code structure. Again, why do we do this? Is because I want to have a high output resistance. Why? Because the ideal current mirror and mirror <coughs> source has an infinite output impedance. I want to get closer to infinite, that's why I stack it. In the same context, if you want to stack one more, that will be even greater. Of course, the overdrive voltage will become uh, problematic. And to, in particular, this output impedance seen from this node will be now R03, R03 multiplied by GM R02 plus 1. That will be multiplied by R03. So it's much greater than before. What do you lose? One is the overdrive voltage. And the question we have is how do you generate BB? That's always an issue, right? Simplest possible way to generate BB is to stack on a diode connection over here. Then you can just connect. Just like over here, you have a diode connection and then provide that gain voltage to the BB. But that will lose significantly in the overhead. So that's why we might want to have low voltage output swing. So this is what I'm talking about. Simpler solution with, if you had a, a VDD that's let's say three volt, probably you can try this. But if your VDD was 1.2 volt, stacking these two would be already consuming too much overhead, I mean overdrive voltage. So that's why you might want to consider using low voltage cast core current here, whereby you can connect this the input over here and the BB. There's another BB here, right? How do you generate this? We'll come back to that. But anyways, by doing that, you can actually generate 
uh, VB, uh, the V X node over here, and VB will be generated through the com uh, configuration. But of course, the bias circuit we have to add on top of what we had before. Previous one, we just need a data connection, but here you need to generate the VB with the bias circuit we learned from lecture nine. But anyways, uh, given that we now will achieve really high output impedance, at the same time, the overhead overdrive voltage is less than the previous <coughs> version. All right. So how to generate VB is that you're gonna have another generation circuit with the MB and MB over here, and you need to watch out for the ratio. In the lecture, we did the analysis, and we found that uh, the LB, the L, LB and L1, LB is here, and the L1 is over here. The ratio should be one to four. Then you can generate the VB to be exactly matching. In other words, the width of the WB should be one four. Any questions up to this point? All right. Now we will move on to the differential amplifiers, which is basically the same as single stage, except you have now two output and two inputs. Common mode concept. Did everyone understand the common mode concept? Probably I can skip this one. And then if you look carefully, this is nothing but you have a common source and the bar near to M2, and then you have a cooper transistor, which is M3, controlling the bias of these two. And the RBs are connected. Of course, if I do this, we observe that you are limiting the output because of the RB. And what do you want to do? Whenever you see this RB like this, what do you want to do? I want to replace it with what? I keep low. And that's what we are going to cover. <coughs> Probably before we do that, a lot of students, I think around 70% of students ask, how do you calculate the offset voltage? That's some project. I'll come back to that in the, uh, I'll come back to that for the differential, I mean the uh, APM, but for, for differential and <coughs> bars, the offset is as follows. I write, if you have no difference in the input, the output voltage should be zero. Difference should be zero. But in reality, if you have input shorted, shorted means you only have a common mode voltage to provide saturation for M1 and M2, and you short the AC signal, then the output should be zero, but in reality it's not zero. That's output offset in differential amplifiers. All right? And the DC offset, in input offset will be, that output offset is there, then how do you actually make a zero offset? You might need to skew the input intentionally to nullify that output offset. That's the input offset concept. All right. So if there's an output offset, you have to divide it by the gain and then give the opposite polarity in the input. That will theoretically remove the offset in the output. That's the input offset. Yes. Okay. the input, the output was hundred to the level. Right. Let's say if this is differential, the difference in the output, if there's no difference in the input, you should be getting zero in the difference. But let's say you got hundred to the level and the gain was hundred. Then how do you remove this hundred to the level? Can you think about it? Can you do something like this? This is 100 millivolt. If you give minus one millivolt, probably then you have zero. And how do I get minus one? Because you have 100 millivolt, the gain is 100. You divide the output by 100, which is gain. That's the input. That theoretically you have to give to nullify this offset. This is called the output offset. It's a physical value. Input offset is theoretical value. 
that you divide the output of the final game, then there's a theoretical value that you have to provide a game to, to notify that output. Okay, is that clear? In the OPM, you only have one output, then how do you calculate the offset? Now the answer is, typically if nothing else is given, then if your supply is too low, then half of the supply is typically target OPM, which is one volt. So you target one volt as the output bias, and then your actual value is 1.1 volt, then you have 100 millivolt offset. In the subproduct 3, the range was given as 0 0.9 to 1.0 volt. Uh, okay, I'm talking about, yes, the subproject. And now, in this case, the target should be 0 0.95 volt. Because although this is satisfying the upper range, if this was an ideal one, you need to have the center, which is 0 0.95. And how off are you from 0 0.95? That's the upper offset. You run the simulation, your amplifier settles at 1 volt in the output you have 15 millivolt offset in the output. And if your gain was 100, your input offset is minus 0 0.5. I mean, your out, I mean, input offset is 0 0.5. Why? Because your output offset was 15 millivolt, your gain was 100. Right? That's how we actually calculate the offset. Yes, do you have a I mean, this, is, this would be too much for this uh, third one, third subject, right? Because it was supposed to be lower than one million. One millivolt. One yes. millivolt in the input. <coughs> offset in, in the sense when you say an offset of an amplifier, we're talking about input offset. And that's why always we care about input offset. Yeah. Anyways, that's the concept of the offset. And now we have this amplifier. Uh, is the offset clear now? Okay. You have this amplifier. Uh, as I always say, don't panic. And you are going to identify how many poles and zeros we have. We will come back to that. But before we do that, where's the input and where's the output? We find that inputs are here and the outputs are here. How many poles and zeros? Assuming these are matched. If this is matched, you don't have to worry about two sides. You're just looking one side. Let's say there's a source impedance. How many poles and zeros? Two poles and one zero. Can you see that? Why? Again, it's the same methodology, right? You have the input to the output. This is signal path. There exists one pole here because there's traffic capacitance. And I already assumed there's an impedance in the source. So there's one pole. Another pole is over here because you have the resistance, R04, internal to R2, and then there are capacitance. And there's one zero because there's high pass filter here on the drastic overlap in capacitance. Can you see that? <coughs> All right. What is the gain of this amplifier? GM1 will be the same as GM2, so you just look at half circuit. Let's just let's look at GM2. It's GM2 multiplied by R04 in parallel with R02. Is that clear? Sorry? Are we all clear here? Now, then what about the rest of the circuit? What does the rest of the circuit do? Current. M5 is providing the pair current for M1 and M2. And that current is controlled by M6. Direct connection. And then M6 has a reference current flowing by RB. And what about M7? What does M7 do? It provides current to the M, I mean, the bias to the M4 and M2, which is working as active load. So the M3 and M4 should be in saturation always. Is that clear? All right. Now move on. And in some cases, you might want to have differential to single ended converter, like here, M3 and M4, which now you have a differential input and single ended output. That's quite common in OPM. <coughs> and here's another problem that you are facing in some project about common voltage. And some of you got deducted. You got you got this result okay, but got deducted. And the common comment from the GE was you didn't include the simulation. Okay. Then how do you simulate common voltage? 
actually this sign already tells you how to simulate. Can you imagine? And I also mentioned twice in the lecture as well. The way you simulate column mode is as follows. As the name speaks itself, you short input one and two. And then provide the same phase sine wave into the input. If the common mode rejection ratio is infinite, that same input, because there's no voltage difference, if you swing in the post in the sine wave, let's say 15 millivolt, 100 millivolt, the output should stay at DC, not 5 volt. But in reality, you will see a small amount of swing in the output. That output swing divided by the input, that's the common mode gain. Although the main is a little bit deceptive because you're not getting any gain, you'll be actually suppressing a significant amount. Typically, you'll be suppressing more than two orders of magnitude. I know that some of you got like a 0 0.5 common mode gain, which means it's like a, a same order of magnitude, but that's fine. And typically, the common mode gain will be much, much lower than one. But that's how you simulate the common mode, right? You got a differential gain, and then you simulate the common mode gain, you divide it, that's the common mode in rate rejection ratio, in dB, that'll be in simulation. Right? Any questions? Okay, move on. Similar would be 20 log of the differential gain divided by common mode gain. And remember, this is log in voltage. 20 dB in voltage is 10 times. 20 dB in power is how many times? You're thinking too much. <laughs> okay. I always like to uh, simplify things. How do you, what is power? How do you calculate power? Voltage multiplied by current. If you have a fixed resistance, voltage squared. Don't be confused, all right? <laughs> of course, the power amplifier I didn't cover in E or before AC, but these are all related. What you have learned from E2021, what you learned from here, what you learned from signal and system, they are all related. All right, just, just keep that in mind. <coughs> okay, here comes the frequency response part two, which is, I consider fun, but some of you <laughs> consider this a little bit confusing. But now you understand, here we have two poles and one zero. One zero over here, one pole at the output, one pole at the input. All right? And here, with the differential to single-ended converters, it'll be a little bit different. We have to watch out a little bit. Now there are two, there exists two paths. One path is going through here, just like a common gray and bar, and it goes through here. The other path is through this path. And we have to watch carefully. How many poles and zeros do we see here? That's something that we have to watch out for. And that's how we actually calculate it. The red path, we have two poles. One is from the source, the other one is from here. Actually, in the source here, we don't see the source impedance. So there's one. One is located at here, the other one is located at the output. So if you do have the source impedance, the pole will be one, two, and three. But since here you don't have a pole, uh, since in, uh, impedance in the force is not shown, then mm -hmm. the remaining pole will be one here and one in the output. Is that clear? All right? And the 
blue path that one pool where? Again, if the source impedance was there, then it would be one over here, then one would be over here. Why? Because this is ground. This is ground, so you don't have to worry about this path. Ground has zero impedance, so you don't have to worry about this path. So you have one potential in here, one potential in here. However, this is no source impedance. So we need at the other node. So red path has two poles, blue path has one pole. <coughs> All right? What about zero? Of course, potentially you need to think about two paths here. One is the zero located over here. You see the high path over here? One other one here. Right? But if you look at here, yes, there is overlapping capacitance, but what is the impedance you are seeing? Interesting, interesting question to ask. We will be only considering that zero seen from, if you, if you look at the transfer function, you only see actually one zero located. And what is that location? It's actually twice the amount of the four location two, and there's one zero only located at twice the GM3 of CMAX. And GM3 is located over here. And you can see that the GM, you, if you look at the impedance over here, that would be one over GM, very small amount. And there's potentially one overlapping capacitance and one overlapping capacitance, which has similar value, right? The overlapping will be similar, and then you have one over GM. That's where the zero is located. Can you see that? So whenever, <coughs> you're, uh, whenever you see a path, Conclusion is if you see a low pass filter, that's equivalent to a pole. Whenever you see a high pass filter, that's zero. That's how you're going to um, determine where the location of poles and zeros are in a given circuit. And if you don't have a source impedance, you don't have to worry about it because that impedance can be considered as zero, meaning that if you multiply the capacitance with zero, then you'll be zero. So you don't have to worry about that part. All right? Only one zero in here. So because that's happening over here. Sorry? It's actually not two, two times the bigger because when, when you're seeing it, the one is zero here, and it, the same impedance will be seen over here, right? If you look at this node and this node, same impedance will be seen because they are connected. It's one over GM seen to GM2. So theoretically, how you can think about it is that you are seeing two parallel capacitances. Can just merge it together. That's what's happening. I'm oh, sorry, there, so there will be a zero for x, so a constant for. No, no, no. What I'm saying is as follows there's one capacitance and there's another capacitance over here, right? Those capacitances are all to the ground. Can you see it? So there are two capacitances. That's why you see two. All right? One zero, because those are those two capacitor <coughs> values are similar, and you can approximate. Yeah, so in, value. in values, yes. Oh, I need different nodes. No, it's not different nodes, it's the same node. They're connected. Oh, it's shorted, it's so it's the same node. Don't be confused. So whatever you're seeing from here is the same node as this one. You shouldn't confuse it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. This is why CX is shown here. Yeah. That all the combined capacitance of these uh, parity capacitors. Right? You, you, if you think through deeply, you will be confused. Think it very simply. Just to summarize up to this point, we have differential and tunnel mode signals. Differential care amplifiers are used to amplify the difference. And you can use differential to single ended converter to convert the differential signal into single ended. And common mode rejection ratio was covered as well. Okay, um, do you want to have a short break now or should we cover the PM and then have a short break? Let's cover this and then have a short break. <laughs> okay. OPM, okay, this is an OPM and how is 
there anyone who can tell me how to analyze this? The first thing is not, not typing, and then how do you know where the input and outputs are? Yeah, I see that inputs are clear, output is clear. And you can see that there's two states. One state is for M1 and M2. The second state is for M6 and M7. And M6, is this a voltage power? No, why? You're getting the output from grain. It looks like voltage power, but it's not, right? Because it's a PMOS. This is common source amplifier. First stage is common source amplifier differential pair, which should be around 40 dBA target. Second stage is another common source amplifier under 40 dB. So probably overall gain will be around 80 dB. 80 dB means 10 to the power of 4, 10,000. So that's sufficiently high for OPM. But anyways, um, we find that this uh, there is differential to single entry converter here, and there is also M6 <coughs> in the output node. Then what are these? M5, M7, and M8. <coughs> First of all, M7 is functioning as an active load for M6. At the same time, it's providing bias current. And where does the bias current from, come from? It's copied from this side. And so is this M5. You're copying this current to the M5. Right? Very good. So no signal gain is combination multiplication of the first stage gain multiplied by the second stage gain. The first stage gain is GM2 multiplied by R04 in parallel with R02. Second stage gain is GM6 multiplied by R06 in parallel with R07. Is it clear to everyone? Now, if you had another test code structure, that meaning that M6 drain is test coded, probably nothing changes except the second stage gain is now GM6 multiplied by R07, because this is very high compared to this one. Right? So you don't, if you just memorize this, you know, memorize these equations, then you cannot analyze. But if you didn't memorize, but you know the concept well, whatever the circuit you're given, you'll be able to analyze it. Right? That's what we need to do. Anyway, output resistance from the output node will be MR07 in parallel with R06. DC analysis, we also did it. Any questions on DC, DC analysis, by the way? For example, what is the required swing at M6? In order for M6 to remain in saturation, we need to make sure overdrive voltage is maintained at least 200 millivolt. Also, at least 200 millivolt maintained over here. That's about it. And systematic offset is the constant whereby we mentioned. This should be the same as this. Then the systematic offset is minimized. And the target output level, DC level, should be half of the if nothing else was given. So project number three was intentionally a little bit difficult, made it difficult in a way that VD was zero, but the target output was different. So that was a little bit of a skew, I mean, that's a project two, but that was like a skew. But anyways, then if, uh, if nothing else was given, then the supply, half of the supply should be a target output swing. Otherwise, it's the same as the exam system. It's too easy. So, anyways, um, that was what the system that was covering. Okay, this is the dual of what we covered. If you look carefully, now the M1 and M2 is the PMOS input pair with the active load being M4, and then you're coupling it to the MOS common source amplifiers. Output impedance is still R07 in parallel with R06. All right. Telescope OPM, what is this? You have the R0 double prime and R0 prime, much greater than a single stack, right? And then by doing that, your output impedance will be much, much greater. And what kind of amplifier is this? Is this a voltage amplifier or a current amplifier? It's ideal for current amplifier, why? Because in the current source, you want to have high output impedance. 
there someone waiting outside? So by doing so, you can actually have a higher gain with the high output impedance, but at the cost of much more reduced swing because of the overdrive voltage you have to maintain. Smooth signal gain we already can calculate. Smooth signal gain would be something like <coughs> Gm2, because you have input here, output over here, Gm of 2 or Gm of 1 is what it matters. Gm2 multiplied by output mode impedance. And what is output mode impedance? First of all, this sign is R08 multiplied by 1 plus Gm8 multiplied by R02. That's this sign. Similarly, that's the, swing, that's the uh, impedance you're getting to the M6 and M4 side. It's not just R06, but R04, which is a PMOS. PMOS. And then that R04 will be multiplied by GM6 plus 1. And those two are in parallel. This will be orders of greater gain compared to the single, I mean, low stack conversion. Any questions? All right. And this is what we call the telescopic OTA, operational transconductance amplifier. And transconductance means you're transferring voltage to impedance, I mean to current. And the opposite of that is the transimpedance. You are transferring the current into the voltage. So we, keep, we call it OTA because you have the current output as an amplifier. And this is really commonly used in biomedical applications. Yeah, I'll just think probably I can skip. And then we'll summarize two stage OPM. There's voltage OPM and current OPM. And two stage OPM is nothing but a differential pair stage in the common source stage in the output, second stage. First stage provides around 40 dB of target. Game, and the second stage provides another 40 dB. Right? The main objective here is to add in the second stage to boost the overall gain. Okay? And this is designed to set the operating point. That's the first starting point. You're probably asking that. That's how I will start as well. I'll start to the amplifier. And then make sure that the output swing is also meeting the requirement. And don't forget the output offset you also need to worry about in the OPM design. If there's no other condition given, preferably you want to set it as half of the dB. Any questions in the differential amplifier and OPM? Let's have another 10 minute break. Thank you. was delayed by 180 degrees. That's a big problem. Why? Can you see that? By the time you give a negative feedback, you have an opposite, you have an opposite phase and you're going to flip it into it, you're going to add the amplitude, not subtracting. So it's not negative feedback, it's positive feedback. 
that's happening when you have the gain condition of gain of one and the delay caused by the amplifier is minus 180 degrees. And this is called the, Bork, um, the Barkhausen criterion, as shown over here. And this is what you want to avoid at all costs. Just to give you some background here, I'm saying to summarize the amplitude of one and the phase of minus 180 is something that you want to avoid at all costs. Hence, actual designers don't even want to get near minus 180 for the unique gain, but rather at the gain of one, you want to make sure the phase is at least 45 degrees or even 60 degrees away phase delay. So instead of having minus 180 degrees phase delay, you want to have 120 degrees or less. These two are actually cross-related. So if you have a gain of one, by definition, that phase was, let's say, minus 120. By definition, the phase margin is the difference between 180 to that value. If it was minus 120, that means the difference is 60 degrees. You have a phase margin of 60 degrees. That's about the phase margin you want to target, or more, 60 degrees or more. So you want to have this 120 or above when the gain becomes one. And as you can see, that's actually correlated. Gain margin, that's the phase margin. And gain margin is when the phase hits minus 180, what is the gain? That should be much, much lower than one, right? Those are cross-related, and typically analog designers use phase margin as one of the targets, right? Now, single pole response means, okay, probably we should go back to the slide we've gotten there. If this is the case, if you only have one single pole, what is the maximum phase shift you are experiencing? Minus 90 degrees. Andrea, do you understand? Yeah. If that's the case, what's the phase margin? Because phase stays at minus 90, 90 degrees. Guaranteed stable. So if you have a single pole, your amplifier is guaranteed stable. That's what the main message I wanted to give you here. And that's what I mean by single pole response. Okay, if you have a pole, one pole over here, and two, second pole over here, there's a potential this is becoming instable or unstable. So your goal is to make sure the second pole is pushed away, way above the unity gain point. So that until you hit the unity gain point, you only see single pole. Because unity gain is where we determine the phase margin, if the second pole is sufficiently above unity gain, you can regard that as a single pole response, right? That's the target. And here, in this particular example, you can see that the unity gain is over here in light blue, and I extrapolate. That's even beyond minus 180 degrees, so it's guaranteed unstable. We already passed 180 degrees. So, whereas if you look at this response, you can see that the unity gain point, you can see the phase margin is, because around 120, you get around 65 degrees phase margin. So this is what you want to have. If you compare these two, what are something that is interesting as we find? In terms of the bandwidth, which one is better? This one is better. In terms of stability, this one is better. Again, no free lunch. You're getting stability at the cost of reduced bandwidth, right? So anything, anything in the analog is about trade-off you're making. But if you compare these two, the difference is this uh, one on the left, pole one and pole two are close by, whereas in the second one, pole one and pole two are further away. So it, below the unity gain, you only see single pole. Okay, that was what we talked about, and. For the frequency response of the true state of the M, we extrapolated. So this CGD with the middle cap is black, we have the C1 and C2. And C1 is the overlapping capacitance multiplied by the gain plus one. That's what C1 is about. C2 is similar to the CL with CGD and all the plastics, but typically the load capacitor, like in the subproject three, load capacitance is in picofarad which is much, much greater than the plastic capacitors. You can lump some into the load capacitors, typically. Now, 
what our interest is, which one is greater? What is the dominant pole? It's, it's difficult to tell at this point because C1 is also quite big due to the gain of M5. Load capacitor is also quite big. Probably both are comparable, so we have to watch out and calculate which one is the dominant pole. And what we did was we actually calculated based on that R1C1 over 1 over R1C1, that's the pole 1. 1 over R2C2 is pole over 2. And that means if you draw it, this is how it looks like. Probably those are comparable because pole number 1 or pole number 2, those are both big capacitors. And potentially you don't have base margin. Or this is not efficient. That's why we want to do the compensation. How do you do the compensation? Still learning? You want to separate these two poles. And how do you do that? If you listen to what we did, was we intentionally insert the capacitor, like high capacitor. In other words, we insert the zero intentionally. In the equivalent circuit, it looks like this. And what's the effect of that? Now the output impedance is still R05 in pair of R06. First stage is still R04 in pair of R02. So if you look at it, now the zero, and look at the uh, full location with the addition of that DC, becomes now the pole over one, one over R0, multiplied by these GN5R out, multiplied by DC, and pole location two is something like this. 0 becomes GM5 divided by CC, and CC is already absorbing the overlapping capacitor CDD because CC is typically much greater in, in magnitude. Now, the effect of that is pole 2 is further away pushed to the power frequency, and pole 1 is pushed to the closer to the DC. And this is likely pole 1 becomes on the pole. This is called a pole splitting because you are divorcing P1 and P2 and then let them separate as far away as possible. And this is called frequency compensation. Now, in both part, how it looks like is instead of the dotted line, which is the previous uh, response, you are now going to push the pole location one to the lower to DC at the cost of reduced bandwidth, of course, and then pushing away the P2 to the higher frequency. Now, the base margin is sufficient. That's what we are doing. This is a hacking case. This is a scenario one. The pole at the force plane, the pole one and pole two are sufficiently away, and then you have sufficient margin. But there may be another case. You did achieve splitting pole one and pole two, but pole two is still above the unity gain frequency. And by doing that, if you plot it, you do have my base margin, but that's not sufficient. Plain it means it's not sufficient. You need to have at least consistent gains. So in this case, you might need to further split it by inserting larger CC, but what's the problem with inserting larger CC? Your bandwidth is reduced too much. And also, the greater problem is zero location after the compensation is also lowered. And if you lower the zero too much, that will contribute to the instability as well because this is right hand side zero. So this is a cross way. There's a certain limit to which you can increase the CC to split the, split the poles. So then how do you actually solve this issue is that you, you can add a small resistor in series with the CC. It seems a small change, but if you do the transfer function, there's an interesting aspect. Now from the input to the output, instead of just the CC, you have a series RC. And if you do transfer function, you will find this transfer function is now solving at the one minus GM5 RC minus GM5 over SCC is zero, equals to zero. Which means now the zero location is depending on one over GM5 and RC, maybe left hand side or right hand side, depending on the values. Right, that's what's important. Because zero in the magnitude <coughs> is always plus 23 degrees uh, per decay, but zero on the right-hand side have a different, I mean, leading and lagging is different. Zero on the left-hand side will be functioning as, if you recall, 
Oops, sorry. I'll pull back to that slide to summarize for you. Oops. Okay, pull back here. So if you look at the zero, the zero on the left hand side is 45 degrees per decade increase. Whereas the right hand side zero is minus 45. And minus 45 per decade in phase response is bad because that will reduce the amount of phase margin. Whereas if you have 45 degrees plus, that will increase the margin. So you want to have the you want to have the zero to be on the left hand side, not on the right hand side. And left hand side zero means you want to have negative zero. And how do you achieve that? this. If you have RC value greater than 1 over GN, now the 0 becomes negative. Negative 0 means you're on the left hand side. And as I said, the phase margin wise, you want to have left hand side 0 because that will have plus 45 degrees per decade response in the phase. Right? So how do you do that? I have room uh, derivation over here, but if you have the RC equal to 1 over GM, then completely eliminate the zero, or if RC is greater than 1 over GM phi, then you have the left hand side zero, which will have more margin in the base. So probably I'll choose the latter. Right? So what do I mean by that? You have now 45 degrees plus and minus 45 degrees from the four location two. Those are compensating each other, canceling each other. So with that, you just have a single core response because plus 45 degrees per decade in the zero and then minus 45 degrees per decade in core two are canceling each other. <coughs> As a result, you only have a single core response guaranteed stable. Right? That sounds like a magic, but this is how your the lead compensation does. Any questions up to here? Right. And that's what I mean by single core response. Uh, unity gain bandwidth was covered. Now we go to the last section, which is the bias circuit. Now we talked about this, this circuit with the differential to power power followed by a single stage, but there's one thing missing in the puzzle, which is TV. How do you generate it? By now, you already have a temptation to use the current mirror, which we will be doing. Current mirror to generate the VGS for the M5, the same as the M7, which will then copy the current from the reference circuit. And uh, the way you do it is by generating the current mirror like this. And, okay, there you go. This is called a self-biasing current mirror, whereby you have the ratio of 1 to k, 1 to k over here, then the reference current and the input current will have a correspondingly same ratio. In other words, if you have the current, um, the reference current is, if you ratio it this way, the reference current will be k times than equals to the input current, meaning that if you have an input current multiplied by k times, that will flow into the reference. That makes sense because m1 to m2 is 1 to k. Current flowing through here, multiplied by k will be the reference current. And that relation is this. Alright? There is one single problem with this relation, by the way, is that if you observe this, when do you satisfy this condition? Right? Let's say you have a reference current of 10, k is 10 and the input is 1. That's one, one when this uh, condition is met. If you have reference current of one, two, three, everything is satisfying as long as there are two, I mean this, uh, let's say, a first order equation is always meaning satisfying. So you need to have another constraint to make sure you have a single reference current that is satisfying the circuit. I mean this value you, you want. Because, for example, I want to make sure the reference current is, or input current is, uh, let's say, one micron. I want to make sure the reference, circuit, reference current is 10 micron, and it only, settles at 10 micron, not the other values. How do you do that? You need to have another second constraint. 
So the two constraints you mix, that's where the target term is going. And how do you do that? That can be done by inserting a register here. And by inserting there, we have now satisfied BGS1 is equals to BGS2 plus RS R R R meaning that this voltage is R red multiplied by RS. And that value is the same as BGS2 plus that value becoming BGS1. That's where you're moving another constraint there. However, this relation has two stable points. One stable point is target BGS, where BGS2 plus RS RF is met. Or the second stable point is when BGS1 is 0, BGS2 is 0, IREF is 0. Both there are two. You have added one constraint by adding the RS, but instead of having one single stable point, you have five stable points. One is everything is zero, the other one is target. You want to make sure that only it settles at not zero here, but also, I mean, only at the target. How do you do that? That's the star observation. And that problem happens if everything is zero, meaning that BGS is zero, BGS2 is zero, current point is zero. So unless you have a startup circuit, this circuit will not come out of that stable point of everything zero and stay there. Okay. And then if you don't have a startup circuit, this is what's going to happen. Your smartphone, you boot up. And when you boot up, it doesn't work. And you, you shake it and then you boot up again, it doesn't work. And sometimes it, it boots up and then it functions normally because by chance with the noise, you might have one point, one point of time goes to this stable point and the other time you just stay remain at zero because both are stable point. That's what, what you want. That's why we need to have a startup circuit so that when everything is zero, you want to make sure the startup circuit tries to pull this M3 gate voltage lower. If the M3 voltage gets lower, then this reference current start flowing. And then when the reference circuit start flowing, that voltage over here gets going higher and you will go to the other stable point. And by the way, the startup circuit should only operate upon system startup, and then it should kill itself, each, each operation itself. Right? That's what the startup circuit is. And if you look at it, that's what M5 and M6 is about, this is the name of it. So when this voltage is zero, you will, you will see the operation of this way. If everything is zero, then M5 is turned off, then M6 is turned off because this is zero. If this is zero, Source voltage is much greater than the gate voltage, so this is turned on. If this is turned on, this M7 will be high. If M7 gate is high, this MOS closes. If this MOS closes, now the voltage over here will be pulled down to ground. And once the full voltage over here is pulled down to lower, and then the difference between source and the gate becomes greater than the threshold, then M3 starts up. Conducting current and then you move to the other stable point. All right, that's how the startup circuit works. When you're designing the startup circuit, this M5, M6, and M7 are overhead after normal operation starts. So you want to make sure this is much smaller than the other transistors. And this is called digital circuit because this operation is just blocking off. Typically, you want to have a minimum length and the width will be around one to one. That's, normal inverters will have one to two per 180 micron, but this one you want to have a switching threshold to be lower. That means that M5 has to be uh, stronger. So that's why if this is a minimum size in 0.18 process, it will be 0.18 micron in length, 0.18 micron in length. Probably our design <coughs> will be, uh, width to be around 0.5, and this is about one, no greater than that. That's sufficient. Any questions? M7 is also a switch, right? Because the role of this M7 is when a fan system startup, it switches on to pull down the current over here, and then after that, it turns off. And the only role of this is to switch on and briefly conduct the current, and then switch off. So you don't need that to be large. You actually need to have a smaller value there. Okay, I think that's about it. So. Let's review. <laughs> this is the beginning of this slide, except that uh, the pants is different. What is to be covered now is what was covered in this module. <laughs> All right?
we covered about analog design, but we covered the circuit simulation, circuit sources, current sources and mirrors, frequency response and compensation, single and multi-stage. Now by reading this, you already have the image. When I say single stage, you already have the single stage as a bar in your head. When you talk about the frequency response, you have that common source, common gate, common brain and the bar, and you already see, okay, I see two poles, one poles, one zero, etc. Right? Differential amplifier analysis and design is extension of single stage except that you have two arms. Operation amplifier means you have a differential in the stage followed by a second stage in the high gain. And if you want to make an OTA, operational stress conductance amplifier, you want to have a test cam, test code operation, test code structure in the upper stage so that the output and gain will be really large. Okay. Now how do we start? Studying voice module, I believe this is what you did, right? You paid attention to the analysis process and methods and master the base and circuit analysis of skill. Yes, we had struggled initially, but now, by now, uh, when I ask the question, the response already tells me you're getting it. Okay, you may need to <coughs> polish it even further, but I'm very happy to see that you're getting it. There are 99% um, of engineers who don't understand. Now I'm getting 1%. The software simulation is to reinforce your understanding and verify the circuit function and troubleshoot your circuit. And this is also very important. Always make sure that you can understand and interpret what you hear in the design process by the simulation. And don't blindly trust the simulation results. You by now know what I'm talking about. Right? Okay. Uh, I think this is already that. And uh, with, before finishing, I always enjoy telling uh, one slide, what is a design, what is an engineer's goal, right? I say researching at a pioneer. Um, if you Google it, you will find this is an actually a column in New York Times. The exact date is October 9, 1903. This is when uh, one of the engineers tried to fly it. They called it a flying machine at that time and they failed. And the column in that day says, the flying machine will fly, uh, that really fly, might be involved by combined and continuous effort of mathematicians and mechanicians from one million to 10 million years. This is a star case. So basically what this uh, column is saying is not gonna happen. <coughs> right, that's 1903, October 9th. Um, exact same day, if you look at the uh, Ori Wright's diary, what it says is that we unpack the rest of the group for the machine. And then you know what happened two months later. Right? So this is what I want to emphasize. When you work as a uh, research and a pioneer, you will encounter so many cases like this, and people will be laughing at you, and this is not gonna happen. But I beg you, don't give up. <laughs> This applies to your final exam as well. Don't give up, <laughs> and you will be able to achieve your goal. So thank you. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'll now I'll be open until the rest of the day. Okay. And if you're busy, you can leave now. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes. For the final, the cheat sheet is one paper. Yes, it's one, uh, one page. Oh, one page. One page. Back and forth. Oh, oh, okay. okay. And uh, try avoid, I say a big page, right? Because um, try, I have seen some students shrinking all the lecture notes. Yeah. Don't do that. It has to be handwritten. Okay. To be fair with the rest, right? Handwritten piece, yes.
It's not actually as bad. We didn't like posting the past in a long time. It refers to all the analysis we call it all the time. It's called price and it's a change. If you really need the exact amount of work, you can find out. Exactly speaking, there are two zero points. And one is the easiest that you're seeing.